No, I think we're good. All right. Well, why don't we get started? And um, as people jump on, we can we can integrate them in. So, uh, just in full disclosure, uh, we are recording this session. We'll have it in our Friday planner for those who couldn't make it today. And um, if I haven't uh, met all of you, my name's Rebecca Snyder, and I'm the executive director of the MDDC Press Association. And as part of uh, one of our programs this year. We always run our into the newsroom session, which tends to be a, a one day cavalcade of skill building and, and uh, presentations, primarily for our, um, for uh, it's skill building for early and career journalists and interns and people who just want to kind of brush up on, on some of the basics. And so we kicked off the series two weeks ago, and now we are coming every other Wednesday from 9.30 to 10.15 to talk about particular topics. Um, and so today, I am delighted to have Tom Lenthicum, who among all of his um, illustrious credentials is also our foundation board president, um, a retired uh, adjunct lecturer at the University of Maryland for I would say 15 years, maybe. Sound right? 22. 22. Uh, and a uh, established and well-known editor, uh, uh, formerly of the Daily Record and the Baltimore Sun, uh, consultant and lecturer. So delighted to have him here today to talk to us about interviewing and building rapport. And he's throwing in the extra critical step of doing it all remotely, which I know I struggle with. So. Um, we will, our program will go till about 10 o'clock, 10.05, and then the rest of our time is really just going to be open discussion about whatever's on your mind. So with no further ado, Tom, it's all on you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and hello, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, not starting your 4th of July holiday weekend quite yet, although with this work at home stuff, it's not, you, you don't get those nice clear distinctions anymore. You can start to uh, segue into um, into the holiday weekend, maybe as soon as we're old. Anyway, it, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, and to talk about things and to get our program launched. Um, what we're talking about this morning is interviewing and building rapport with uh, remotely thrown in as a, uh, as a challenge. Um, this would ordinarily be about a two-hour class that I would teach at the University of Maryland, so you are getting the lean and mean uh, stripped down version. Um, I will have some handouts, um, which I'll pull together with bullet points of what we, uh, what I talked to you about today. We'll get those out to you in, in the next few days, so you will have that to uh, follow up with, maybe to help you remember some of the key points that, that we talk about this morning. Um, so let, we'll get started. If more people join us along the way, uh, that's fine, but we won't stop and, and do round robin introductions like we did the last time because we've got a pretty tight time window here. So we'll just roll. Um, interviewing and building rapport are two of the basic things that we do as reporters. And if you think about it, we do it as human beings as well, just in terms of uh, our family and meeting new people and how we interact with people at work. Um, so we all do this a lot. <clears throat> so there's a temptation among all of us to think, well, this is stuff I do every day. So this is no big deal. I know how to do this. Uh, and on one level, we do know how to do it. But at, on a professional level, as journalists, when you've got to be concerned about getting the facts exactly right and also concentrating on what is said, what is not said, and how it's said, um, that adds a whole other degree of complexity to it. That's hard enough to do in ordinary times. But we do not live in ordinary times. Um, we are living uh, in the COVID-19 era. So uh, in many cases, you are not going to have person-to-person -person direct human contact with the person with whom you're trying to build rapport, with the person whom you are interviewing. Um, 
So we want to talk this morning about, we want to acknowledge that fact, number one, and then number two, talk about what are some ways that we can work around those challenges. Um, and I'll have some suggestions for you, and you may well have some suggestions uh, for all of us too. So we'll make this uh, as interactive as, as we can make it. Um, First, I have to go against everything I've told my students for about 22 years, which is always, 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 always talk to your source in person, unless it is just absolutely impossible. Because there are so many benefits that come from that, particularly if you are trying to build rapport. If it's not just an interview or a story, but if you're new on a beat and you are covering uh, something, um, you want to establish face-to-face -face contact. Um, that is still the gold standard. That still trumps every other kind of um, contact. Um, but that is becoming harder and harder to do. So we want to work um, around that. Um, once you do establish that rapport in person, then you can back off and you can use email or you can use text or you can use uh, telephone or whatever. Um, but you want to try to get that initial contact to establish the baseline relationship as uh, as in person as possible. Um, so let's talk first about um, building rapport. Then we'll segue from that to uh, interviewing. Um, first of all, if you can't have, if, if you can't just call somebody up and say, "Hey, can I come to your office? Can we do this and do it?" Um, do it the way we, we used to do it. Um, think about, are there any ways that you might be able to have uh, a person contact with, with this person? Um, by that, I mean, um, is there a press briefing that's being handled? And yeah, they're going to have rules about social discipline and whatever, but the person that you're looking for is going to be there and will be a speaker at the uh, or maybe just a staff person on the side of the press briefing. Do that if you possibly can. Um, use your listening and your mask to only get it out because you're not appropriately attired for the occasion and taking the precautions. But you want to be there if you possibly can. Um, now, why do you want to be there? You want to be there because it's going to demonstrate to the person that you care enough to be there in this era where a lot of people are hunkering down at home and in the garage and in the basement. And you can still do pretty good work from there, but there's still not, there's no substitute, particularly if you're trying to cover a beat or subject matter area. Um, maybe as an intern, you get assigned to the courts for the summer, you get assigned to cops for the summer. Um, so uh, you you want to um, get around that as, as much as possible. I'm sitting a message here about audio quality here. I don't know. Can 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 everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm not sure what Zoom is trying to tell me, but we won't worry about that. Um so number one, make sure that your source knows that you were there. Ideally, by chatting with them some um during the actual uh event right after the actual event. But if not, um, find a way to tell them either with through an email or a text or a phone call that, by the way, I saw you at the at the event, or I was at the rally, I was at the protest uh, march, I was at the parade, um, I interviewed some people, I have some follow-up questions I'd, I'd like to ask. By doing that, you are showing that you are willing to go the extra mile, sometimes literally, uh, to get to the uh, story these days. And that's going to enhance your credibility uh, with, the, with the stories that, that you're uh, trying to uh, cultivate. What you're trying to do is to stand out from the crowd. You don't want to be um, just a, a disconnected voice in the ear. You want to be a real person who's eager to do what it takes to cover the beat. And if it takes uh, doing something that's inconvenient, driving uh, across town or driving out in the hand, establish your credibility and help you build the 
source is going to instinctively have more respect for you if you are making that effort just to be there, just to make human contact, just to interview the people involved in the protest. Um, and that will that'll win you sources uh, in government, that'll win you sources in the, in the protest movement, and that'll win you sources at the PTA, all of those things right now because the press is becoming more and more invisible or just a, a, a disjointed figure uh, on the, uh, or maybe even you get a little box on a, on a Zoom screen, but that's about all. So you want them to see you as a, as a human being, um, someone who is caring about what, what, what you're doing and is willing to make the sacrifice to uh, do what it takes. Now, let's talk about um, tools that you can use in building rapport. Let's say that, um, th again, the most effective is going to be that person-to-person -person contact, even if you can only do it once um, and, and let the person know that you were actually there for this event. Uh, that's going to help you um, a lot. Um, next in your hierarchy ought to be the telephone. Remember, Steve Lash talked about this um, when we had our opening session. Um, Steve said that, that he finds that um, a lot of reporters go directly from, if I can't do it in person, I'm gonna, my default is going to be text. My default is going to be email. Um, you're still going to get better um, interaction with your source by telephone. Um, now, why would that be, anybody? Anybody? Ellie, have an idea? Um, well, I guess, you know, when it's an email or a text, they can kind of pre-draft what they're going to say. There's not that much room for natural flow of, of conversation. Like, usually when I get emails, it's from PR, and they sound, like, really boring and structured. It's right. nothing I ever want to quote. Right, exactly. Uh, those are absolutely uh, very good reasons. Um, the um, um, you can also it just puts the interview on a different plane if you and I can because we're talking to each other right now it's a little more human it's a little less formal I can see things about you from your workspace and 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 you can see me where I am and so it's just a little more uh, hu uh, human and you can see if the person is reacting poorly to your question you can read and get a little bit of um, a, uh, a hint from that, none of which you're going to get in an email or a text. So make the phone your 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 next default, um, and then you can go to email or or uh, text. And obviously, you've got if if you're uh, to back up for a minute, if you if you can't go directly to an event and meet somebody in person, then your default ought to be to Skype or to Zoom or anything, so you can get that that personal picture and I can get a picture in my mind. I don't know what Ellie looks like. She knows what I look like. Um, and that just puts the, your relationship on a bit of a, of a different plane. Okay, so that ought to be your hierarchy of ways that you, uh, methods that you use to contact your, your, your source. Um, but what about your sources hierarchy? Because your hierarchy and your sources may not be the same. Matter of fact, in many cases, they probably won't be the same. So particularly if this is someone, this is not a one-off interview, but if this is someone that you're going to need to be in contact with often over the course of your, let's say if you're on a summer internship, um, and this is the local uh, school system or the local uh, court system, local police department, um, and so this is a person that you're going to need to be in contact with on a regular basis. First of all, tell them that. Tell them, I've been assigned this beat by the Daily Bugle. And so you're going to be hearing from me a lot this summer. Um, so A, they, they know that. They know this isn't just a, a one-off. Um, and then ask them, what's, what's the best way for me to reach you? What's your preferred um, way, method of uh, contact? Um, I was interviewing, uh, or not interviewing, I was trying to get hold of somebody um, um, a couple of years ago at a, at a major law firm in uh, Baltimore and uh, could never, I was leaving uh, 
messages of different types, but mainly on his uh, telephone. I was leading voicemail messages. Um, finally, I, I found his administrative assistant and tracked her down. And I said, I just can't get hold of Craig. And here's who I am. And here's how I'm trying to talk to him. I think if he knows I'm trying to talk to him, he would want to, he'd be glad to talk. To him. I said, um, who's his voicemail? And she said, I'm his voicemail. She said, he hates voicemail. It's, it's, I'm surprised you could even leave a message there because it's usually full. I'm the one who clears it and I screen it and then I let him know. She said, what he really responds best to is text messages. He's checking his phone all the time. That's kind of where he lives. I said, okay, got it. Good to know. So you want to find out the same thing from, from your source so that you're trying to get to that person in the, with, in, in a way that is best uh, most likely suited to success. If he, if he says, I never, I hate the text, I, I don't do that. If he says my uh, email um, is uh, is the way to get me or my email is, is overflowing, um, take those hints, okay? Um, also ask your source, what is the best time of day for me to reach you? If I'm often gonna have to check in with you every day, maybe even twice a day for the uh, for the police report or whatever it is. Um, is there a, he might say, if you get me before, uh, my phone starts ringing off the hook at nine o'clock in the morning, but I'm in at eight every morning. So if, if you want to check in between eight and nine, you'll have a really good chance to get me. And if I know that that's going to be your, your call in time, I'll, I'll watch for your call. I'll look for it. Um, so you want to find that out. Um, Let's see, what are we doing here? Then we've got, the other thing is, uh, be sure that you do your homework before you introduce yourself to a, uh, to a source on the beat or whatever. Um, already know, know if, you're, if it's the education, know how the school department is structured. Know who the, if you're talking to the uh, superintendent, know who the deputies are, know who the principal people are, know who the PR person is. Um, so that you can ask informed questions and so you can demonstrate to the person you're trying to build rapport with that you're a hard worker, that you really care about this, that you took the time to learn uh, who these people are and how the system works. And um, so you're not starting uh, off at uh, ground zero. That again is gonna earn you credibility with the uh, source that you're trying to build rapport with. And there's no better builder of credibility of rapport than credibility, because that means you're going to get your your phone calls and messages returned. There's a higher likelihood you're going to get those returned. There's a higher likelihood the source is going to stay on the phone with you a little bit longer, or stay with you, or answer more questions for clarifications, because he or she will know that you're really dedicated to trying to get to the bottom of the story. Okay, that's interviewing on a um, on an ongoing basis, on a regular basis, beat coverage basis. Now it's a little different if you're interviewing, if this is an in-depth interview. Let's say it's you're fine. doing an interview. Before we what? jump on, I think uh, Benjamin has a, a question. I don't want to put you on the spot, but did you have something you wanted to add to that? Oh, hang on, let me unmute him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. And you can, un everyone can unmute themselves. Actually, Ben, there you are. Okay, yeah. Hi, this is Benjamin's Publishing House, 1776. Uh, thank you so much for hosting this, and it's very informative. And, 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 and I do, my question, and I agree with you, building a rapport is so important, and, uh, you know, it's one of the best practices in communication. So thank you. Thank, um, but my question is more, we're out, we're, we're, well, we're all over the country, but we're um, relatively new doing uh, journalism and stuff in, uh, in Maryland. And uh, my question was, do you, I, like in different states, certain municipalities will require you to apply for a press um, pass or, you know, uh, pending on, I don't know if that's true in the state of Mar in the state of Maryland. Not if you're just doing beat stuff, like trying to do like, you know, it's public information. If it's uh, uh, an arrest, or if it's uh, um, a, a you know a protest, or things like that, those never need a, you never need any kind of special approval. 
but I didn't know if uh, you, if the if you have to register as a you know with the press with the the gut with the, any type of municipality or county or state to gain access to anything like that. Uh, good question. At the at, at the state level, uh, if if you for instance are covering the and this is a long answer that I'm going to really hone it down, but if if you're uh, covering the state legislature, right. Um, because of security at the state house, you have to have a pass. You have to, and you can, and you can find out how, how you apply for that. Um, all, all, our, all my authors do have passes. All my authors have press passes, but I didn't already because uh, you know uh, we, I mean we're a house, and we have also. Uh, but uh, what I'm asking is, do we have to register with it, in, like any kind of county government that, that we wanted to go to a court? I, I think the courts are pretty much open. Unless probably they're... no. Um, right. but if you, if you do have to register with anybody, it will probably be your local police department. So right, that's what I was saying. Ask yeah. locally, do I need a press pass? And if so, how do I get it? Um, right. well, we, we have press passes for our authors already. I mean, we're, we, we, you know, we're so also just to, to kind of, um, fill that I've not heard of any, um, any uh, outlet required to show a government issued press pass to cover a story. Everyone usually right. has their own. Um, you will sometimes need, like, like Tom was saying with the state house, there are certain areas that are restricted and you right. need credentials to be able to access those, those areas, but you don't need a press credential to speak to anyone. Um, right. Thank you. That, yeah, that's why I think that because, uh, we're also in the process of uh, becoming uh, White House correspondent and the press gallery in, in, in D.C. And they, you know, we have press passes. It's a badge. You know, you get hired here, you get right. a badge. And, 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 and so, um, uh, but we, I just want to, I'm not as familiar with Maryland as I am with Philadelphia or, or other states. Sure. Know. And I can talk to you offline about it as well. Okay. Um, Tom, what do you do if people don't want Thank to talk to you? I, I was just curious, and maybe you'll get to it a little bit later. Um, thank you so there, much. I appreciate it. Sure, thank you. But if, if a lot of what you were talking about kind of supposed that they wanted to talk to you, what if they don't? How do you do? You have suggestions on tracking people down? Uh, well, that's a whole different discussion. But uh, <laughs> right. in, in a in a home down way, um, even if it's not so much not wanting to talk to you. If it's a if it's a public official who needs to get information out, he or she may not want to talk to you, but they realize that they have to because they're going to communicate to the public through you. So, here's the next phase of how we're going to uh, handle the uh, pandemic uh, openings and closing. We're moving from phase three to phase two. What does that mean? So it's in their best interest to get that sort of information out. So they will probably push out basic information pretty clearly. What what you may have trouble getting them for is any sort of follow up or any or when you maybe start to ask some harder questions about this seems to conflict with that or how does this con this conflicts with the state policy. They may not want to talk to you about that uh, because you're right it does and they really would rather not get in a uh, in an open conflict. So. Um, the best again if you have established this rapport this human rapport uh with them they might be able they might they're going to be more willing to talk to you that doesn't mean they will they also might be willing to take tell you something not for attribution they might be able to tell you something uh off the record that will give you some guidance in terms of how to pursue your your story uh, but the basic building block is to try to get a a human relationship with these people so they can help you a little bit, even though their boss may not want them to be talking to you officially. Okay, let's go to uh, the next phase of interviewing, um, and that is for the in-depth interview. Um, if you're doing a profile of, of, on somebody or a feature story on somebody, um, this is not just gonna be a quick uh, in information dump. So, gold standard is even, more important for this uh, to have an in-person interview and or you want to get as close to that experience as possible through Skype or Zoom. Now, um, why would that be important? Why would that be, why would I stress that more in a 
in an interview for in an in-depth interview than a than a basic uh, get the get the daily news interview. What are you going to learn uh, possibly from either seeing someone in person or seeing them like we're seeing each other now on Skype or Zoom? Anybody? Well, I think if you see them in person, you get the non the nonverbal communications. You can exactly. You can... And a huge part of communication, uh, more than half, studies have shown that more than half, almost two thirds of the message that you get from communication is nonverbal. So you wanna look, so you get to see body language, you get to see uh, reaction, you get to see, gee, the, I, I just said this and the person scowled or winced or shaking his head. Um, um, so you get all these visual cues that you're otherwise not gonna get. Uh, you're going to get cues about dress. You're going to get cues about physical characteristics, uh, particularly if you're doing an in-depth interview for a feature. Or does my person have COVID hair? Does my person have COVID beard? Does my person have COVID clothes? Um, you know, what can you say about that? That a might be helpful for you in, in reading this person or the character, but also might be an interesting ingredient to put in the story, depending on what kind of story it is. Um, the what can you see in the background is this person in a home office if so what does it look like what what pictures are on the wall what what are there awards there are there trophies there what does it look like uh big colorful posters is this person talking to me in his or her kitchen or basement or home gym and if so that's interesting and what's that about um what are the sights and sounds in the background Dogs, cats, kids, parakeets, what's going on? All of these things might also be an opportunity for you to um, um, make a, a human, get some more human interaction, get a little bit out of the formal interviewing mode and say, you know, I see, um, I see you've got six cats uh, crawling around your neck and there's a huge cat poster behind you on the wall. I think you're a cat person. I love cats. Um, and maybe you can get a, a little personal interaction going there, which is going to help lower the barriers a little bit in, that all of us naturally have when you're talking to a perfect stranger and telling them things about yourself. While you're doing that, remember, and we talked about this a little bit last week, that this is a two-way street. So if, if you're looking at this person and, and thinking about clothing and background and, and setting, that person is looking at you and thinking the same thing. So I know somebody had a question last week about what, what are some things I should do about my setting when I'm interviewing somebody. And we know we talked about it doesn't need to be fancy, but just be sure that it's professional um, and be sure that you are dressed professionally and you're groomed for professionally uh, for this encounter because you want to be neutral in this. You don't want to be projecting anything that's going to, that might be an inhibitor um, in terms of establishing that basic rapport for the interview. All right, um, in the last four minutes here, we're gonna do just some general interviewing tips. And this, these, this and some of the other stuff we've talked about will be in the handouts as well. Always have a plan, have a list of questions, have a list of things that you wanna find out, but Always listen very carefully and be flexible with your plan. Um, I have had students over the years that, who are, who've got their checklist and they're very religious about going down the checklist and they ask question A and they check it, but they don't pay attention to what the answer is. The answer they get when they ask question A may not be responsive at all. It may be a non-answer answer. answer. And so, but if you then go on to just to question two, because you heard something, you're not quite sure what it was, but it must've been all okay. Then you get back and you look at your notes and you think, oh, that didn't really answer that at all. And you turn into your editor or your professor who says, hmm, he didn't really answer that at all, did he? And you didn't go back and clarify. So have a plan, be ready, but be flexible. Listening is the key to be sure that you understand what's being said. Um, one way to test for understanding is a technique called reflexive listening. Um, that means repeating what the person has said. If it's a major point the person has, has made, that might be a good time to s slow down the interview a little bit and say, you know, that's, that's really interesting. And you've mentioned that a couple of times now. 
if I hear you correctly, what you're saying is this, this is important, or do this, or don't do that, or this policy has some real problems. Is that right? Do I have that right? Do I understand that? Uh, that does a couple of things. That gives the person a chance to uh, evaluate how he or she is being heard and to see and to test for accuracy. Um, it also um, is going to enhance your credibility with the source because the source is going to know that you are really trying to get it right. You want to get it right. And when you're talking to the person, always say, this is not for me. This is for my readers. How can I best explain this to my readers? What do you want my readers to understand? So that it's not about you. I'm in charge here, although you really may be. But what you really want to be is an ambassador for your, for your readers, because sources will often respond better to that. Um, you got two objectives in an interview. Start them talking, keep them talking. Okay, it doesn't get much simpler than that. To start them talking, uh, anybody know the, di the difference between open-ended questions and closed-ended questions? Okay, open-ended questions are more uh, cosmic stuff. You know, what do you think about uh, climate change or something like that? Uh, closed-ended questions are, are targeted at really specific, limited information. Um, where were you born? How long have you worked in, in the police department? What sort of, what uh, section of town do you uh, live in? This, those are softball questions. Those are batting practice questions. Those are close. That's the best way to get somebody started. Oh, this isn't so bad. I just, I'm just, we're just going over some basic information here. Doesn't, not doing a lot of heavy lifting. Then as you get the person comfortable with you and your interviewing style and what you're trying to find out, move into the more open-ended questions. Um, ask about a defining moment, a defining moment in their life or their career. We all have them. Everybody on this call has got at least has had one defining moment already, maybe several. Um, you might even give an example of, of yourself if the person doesn't respond well to that, but most people do. Most people know what a defining moment is. It may involve a class that they took that changed their major that led them into a whole different uh, career. Um, my my daughter went to uh, Columbia University thinking that she was going to uh, major in English lit and be, be a poet. As soon as she got there, 9/11 uh, happened. Um, Columbia has one of the most uh, the strongest, most advanced programs in in Arab studies in the in, in this country, if, if not the world. She ended up changing her major, majoring in Arabic language and culture, and is now teaching that at the University of South Carolina. That was a true defining moment in her life. Now you might not have, or your source may may or may not have anything that dramatic, but that's what I'm thinking about. Um, something like that. You also can get clues for the possible defining moment by looking in the background and seeing whose pictures on the wall, whose poster is on the wall. Um, I see a big uh, 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 portrait of Martin Luther King on the wall behind you. Can you tell me about that? And so those, those are ways to get your defining moments. And finally, last but not least, go fishing at the end. Throw on a question and said, well, what did I ask you that I should have asked you about? Or what would you like, what's something else you'd like my readers to know about you that we didn't cover today that you think is really important? You never know what you'll get on something like that. You might get anything from, no, nah, I think we got it. Uh, we cover everything. Or you might get something really revealing or really interesting. And it also gives the source one last chance to uh, put something out there that he or she thinks is really important about, uh, about him or her. All right, I'm going to stop there because we've already run a little past 10 and open it up for questions either about interviewing or what we've been talking about today or if anyone wants to talk about your um, internship so far or your job and how it's going, any challenges that came up in the last week. Or is there anything interesting you'd like to share with the group that we well, didn't ask you about earlier? We'll go fish. I went, <laughs> I, I, I went to a, a Black Lives Matter uh, rally this, this weekend. Ah, okay. And, uh, and you went there as a journalist? Yeah, for the, for the yeah. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, and uh, I found it very, I found it very interesting and informative. Um, I, uh, I, I did find that um, what I thought that was cool that it had changed over the years is that they were more interested in justice and feel that it also was a uh, um, transgender people too, um, which I understand that transgender is a small minority and they're you know trying to tap into Black Lives Matter because there's just more population and they have more money. Um, but uh, so that they can be recognized, rightfully so, right? Because they, everybody should, if they have a stance, let them, let them stand up and say it. Um, but uh, but uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter, this one was mostly, believe it or not, white people. Uh, there was a very, very few minority, very few black people. Um, it was in Cadenceville, Maryland. And it, the reason I went there is because they made national news a few weeks ago with um, pulling down different um, art on the walls. Then the, the parents went back in and hung it back up after the teachers pulled it down. And this was before COVID-19. And so they had this uh, protest or rally. I don't know what it was. It, it was more like a rally. It wasn't really a protest because it wasn't like, you know, we're, you know what I mean? We're fighting for something. It was more like a kumbaya kind of thing. Um, and they were fighting because they think hate crime is wrong and murder is wrong. And I agree with them. I mean, you can't have, I mean, that, that's act, that, that's just common sense, you know, it's just um, the commandments or whatever. But they wanted better, more stricter uh, penalties on the, uh, on hate crimes than on like accidental crimes. I thought that was an interesting, I thought that, that I think, I don't like their name per se because I think it causes divisiveness. But um, it, the uh, it is um, they are taking a stance there, and I thought that was pretty good. And they, uh, I thought that was pretty good of them to think that way. Um, although I said, you know, I'm the only one there investing the money. I was the only press there, and I'm the only one investing the time and the money to go there. And um, and and somebody yells out, "You should be ashamed of yourself." I'm the one covering it. Nobody else showed up, right? And, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm there talking to talking to people, asking them why is this, you know. Um, and but uh, <laughs> that's fine by me. And uh, that, that will happen sometimes when you're out. Yeah, do do, do not expect uh, to get a free ride as as a member of the press. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, I, I've been, I've been... maybe offered a free ride out of town uh, but... <laughs> or shot at. <laughs> anyway. Right, feelings are raw and and. Uh, and so, uh, on this um, and, and, and other issues. Okay, and, and thank you, Ben. Uh, You're welcome. Anybody else? I got to interview the Howard County Executive yesterday, and that ah. was, was pretty cool. And now, was that in person, Ellie? Uh, no, not in person, over the phone. But I'm working on a story that I need to speak with a lot of government people, like uh, like in the mayor's office or in the county government and I've never had that experience before and wow it's really slow getting a hold of people like I've, yeah. I've seen slow before but like this was not in a bad way but I I remember um we had an alumni alumna at UNC who like works for the city of Detroit now but used to be a journalist and she said that everybody should like work in county government before they become a journalist so they can understand the pace and I thought that that was kind of funny and I thought of it when I was working on this and I don't know, it was definitely an experience and I'm glad that I had it because that taught me some patience, but I'm excited to get that story in eventually, so. Oh yeah, I'd, I'd like, like to see it when it, when it runs. Um, government does move at its own pace and especially if you're not a regular, Ellie, you know, if, if, if you've been covering that area for three years, uh, people would probably, things would, would move a little faster because you'd be a known entity. Oh, that's LA. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll call her. You might move, your name would float to the top of the, the call list uh, more, more likely. But uh, in, in this case, also keep in mind, that means you need to allow more time. It's going to take longer to do some of these stories because you got to talk to six or eight people, but it may take two weeks to get to those six or eight people, not two days. Yeah. Yeah, I also had um, something interesting happen, like sort of related to that. I'm looking at something that's related to the, the county police. 
Um, and I called the public information officer. Um, he was just like a little short with me. He was like, just send me an email. All right. And then I got a text from one of the other reporters being like, I heard, I heard um, this guy was short with you over the phone. And I was really confused. I was like, how did you know that? Um, and it turns out that the public information officer had texted her and asked like, who called me? I don't know that person. So it was just kind of interesting. Like, start, like, when you're new you don't have like a rapport with any of these people that you're trying to reach out to yet and they can be like a little bit skeptical of you at first so what are some ways that you that you might um, one is uh, if, if you're cold calling somebody in the, uh, the public information officer in the police department um, you might ask before you go look around the room or the virtual room, but you know, think, uh, find out who on the on the regular staff covers cops or, or deals with the PIO a lot, and maybe that person can give you a uh, um, a hint about best way to, to, to deal with the, the yeah with the PIO, or maybe this person would even voluntarily shoot uh, an, an email or text to the PIO and say, hey, we got a summer intern who's going to be doing a lot of police reporting. Her name's Lindsay. She's cool. Cut a break something like that, you know, that might um, just be enough to where it takes some of the shortness out of that uh, initial exchange. Mm -hmm. But also it kind of goes with the territory because you're the, you're the rookie and you're trying to establish yourself mm -hmm. and they don't know. May, may, I, may I add something there? Please. You know what, you know what I found that at, at least in different um, places is like, if you uh, like for the sheriff's office or those types of uh, organizations, when it comes down, when it comes time to pull it, you know, help them be a precinct captain or get involved in get involved in the electional process uh, or be an elector or something like that for their campaign or for multiple campaigns because there's a there's a card and you and, and and you and you work and you can work your way in that way through uh, through knowing knowing the people. That and I found that works well. Okay, uh, Lindsay, I was also thinking, what was 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 that your first contact with the uh, PIO? Yeah, it was it was, and it was just a cold call. Okay, um, so maybe a, another thing you you could do in the in the in the process would be to send like a proactive text or or email. To the PIO at a certain agency or whatever, it says, "Hi, I'm I'm Lindsay. I'm new. I'm here for the summer. I I'm going to be covering your area, and so I just wanted to introduce myself, and uh, so try to establish some some rapport that way, so that the first call that involves real news and real access is not a cold call if you can avoid it." So uh, okay. just I'm. Prompted by seeing that it's 1016, so I just wanted to wrap us up a little bit. And um, uh, Tom, from, from what I understood, uh, interviewing and building rapport is really trying to find the human connection and creating spaces to have substantive conversations. And you can do that by sort of paving your way a little bit and letting people know who you are and uh, how, you'll, how you can best respond to them. And then also making sure you're asking questions designed to draw them out and comforting them by starting off with some, you know, straightforward, easy questions. And it's a process um, and being aware of the, the environment around someone is always really critical for, um, for building that rapport. Um, and I am so grateful that you are going to write out some bullet points of our conversation because you presented a lot of terrific material and I feel like we're um, we are set uh, and and ready to interview a little bit more strongly going forward. So Good. thank you. Um, and also everybody I want to point out Rebecca just did an A plus job of practicing reflexive listening. That's what <laughs> that, that's the technique I was talking about. You summed it up very well. So I'm a, I had a chance to say, no, you got that all wrong. That's not what I meant to say, but well, and I was going to ask, I was going to ask, did I miss anything? But then I was like, <laughs> 1016, I can't do that. Um, but I do a lot of mediation work where we're always listening for feelings, values, and topics and um, not restating a position, but summarizing. So in any case, 
I wanted to thank you all for coming out today. Um, I will have the recording for this uh, and we'll send it out to you. Uh, feel free to reach out to each other, uh, to Tom, to me, whatever's most useful. And I'll also include the recording in the Friday Planner. So thank you all. Now, two Wednesdays from now, which is July 12th, um, we'll be meeting at this at 9.30 to 10.15, and we'll have Graham Cullen of the Frederick News Post talking about digital photography. So he's going to be a, a, a real help to us, and I hope you can make it. So thank you for joining us. Two Wednesdays from now? Yes. That will be July 15th. Then let me double check. I can't get my dates right, but two Wednesdays from now. So that does August 12th is what I was thinking. So you're right. July 15th is where, where we'll be. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have yeah. a great weekend and a great holiday. Thank you.